Welcome in Rose City to Soccer Made in Portland. Ryan Clark here with Chris Reifer. We are fresh off of last night's midweek affair for the points. Portland for the Portland Timbers. They three, got points. Three points against multiple the, points. The San Jose Earthquakes uh, in what was a pretty wild game overall. Uh, pretty up and down, really down at first, and then quite the the the, <laughs> the we're so back segment of the of the circle which I, I, I saw that meme a lot on twitter last night so there there is there is no we're so back <laughs> coming out of that game we can get into that but sure. there is, but i mean to the extent that anybody is is uh is you know genuinely claiming we're so back coming out of that that is that is purely positive self-talk uh and has no relationship to reality for sure. No, it, it uh, there's there's a lot of layers to to that result. Obviously, you know the Timbers are happy to get off the Schneid. They have uh, they had gone nine games prior to that without a victory, which is horrific. Not, I mean, they're good. They were at the bottom of the Western Conference. Uh, right. You know, this is a this is an opportunity f- for them to to make up a little ground against a fellow cellar dweller. Um, <laughs> but but that first half, look like looking back at, at last night's game. Um, down 2-0 at half, uh, looking listless, looking A continuation un- of the second half against Seattle. Yeah, really a continuation of the previous game's second half, uh, and one that showcased a lot of the issues that people had been talking about for weeks about this team. Yep. Um, you know, people in the, the stadium reporting, at least, uh, that Phil Neville was booed coming off the field. Now, whether that was a combination of him and the refs being booed, remains to be no seen. No basis to boo the refs in the first half. But but ah, the second second half, half is in well it depends who you're rooting for and it goes back and forth too because <laughs> um you know the sec the second half is where things totally flipped on ahead for the Timbers. They get a red card call on, on San Jose uh, for a handball in the box. Penalty kick by Evander makes it two one and then you know playing against the ten man earthquakes the, the floodgates open and the Timbers end up winning four two which was not something that anybody expected given given where the halftime score was and, and something that, you know, normally you'd give a ton of praise to the Timbers in this type of situation for, um, for sticking with it, for coming back, for making tactical adjustments, et cetera, et cetera. But frankly, and, and this isn't to undermine the fact that they still did get the points. Th- the game state was created by some pretty serious refereeing errors, I think, uh, a, and a total muster clock of refereeing. Yeah, it was it was it was a really bad performance, I think, from the officials on on both ends. Um, so it it was definitely, um, definitely. I mean, the a, yellow a card ref- on on I think it was Kamal Miller was genuinely very funny. <laughs> it was it, I was laughing. Genuinely very very funny. I, I was like, that's like one of the worst yellow cards I've seen at any level in my life. Um, so, so both ends that were really getting it. Um, and, but the and timbers some of those calls were yeah. the more significant calls get went in, in the timbers favor. And I mean, yeah. I, so, I mean, sort of my take overall is, is, you know, you take the points, but the takes stop at the 60, whatever minute. Yeah. Uh, when, when the referee just totally messed up the game. <laughs> I mean, that's the only that's the only sort of responsible way to assess that game. Uh, after that, San Jose is a man down. It's midweek. Teams are tired as is. Uh, you've got heavy legs. Uh, just completely turns the game on 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 its head with a, a call that's just ridiculous. I mean, it was it <laughs> it was not by rule and guidance a handball. Uh, his, the it, it, his hands were within the silhouette of his body. Uh, they were not in an unnatural position. He did not make himself bigger. If you lop off his arm at his shoulder <laughs> and and act like his hands don't exist, the ball hits him in the hip because that's yeah. where his hand was in front of his hip, which yeah. is exactly pretty... where, where they're supposed to be. So, I mean, it, it just a horrible call, a total breakdown. I think the AR initially flagged it. And I kind of understand why, because the AR can't, the AR can't see the X axis as you're facing the goal, right? Because of where he's standing, you probably saw a little bit of separation between the hand and the body on the, I guess if we want to get geometric about this, the Z axis trigonometric. I don't know. I don't know what the math is, but like the Z axis, that's too much, can, man. I can kind of see that, but like, can't see the X axis. That's one that the referee's got to just say, Hey, no, 
it's fine play on uh referee didn't um in the first of what was just a comedy of errors by by this referee who probably needs to take a play out off or two um to think about some things but yeah i mean so and and i i'm i'm at a loss as to where the var was on that one i mean maybe armando Villarreal, who i think was the var on this game and maybe he was he had to go to the bathroom or something i don't know um that's the only thing i can think uh because it it sh- like when i saw the replay the first time watching on tv i regarded it as a foregone conclusion i was like oh that's no <laughs> that's getting overturned like i i think i like sort of stopped paying attention because i was just like this is a couple minute delay we'll be back at it in a moment and it, i mean it, it does both teams a disservice obviously san jose very rightfully feel aggrieved that a game that they you know were were certainly in the better position and got totally messed up by by just a, a a massive cascade of referee errors from virtually the entire crew uh the timbers i think in some respects also <laughs> are hard done by this cuz leading up to that moment the timbers uh, you know i mean you're right that that at halftime and certainly even a few minutes into the second half san jose i think hit the hit the bar one more time really had pretty firm control. But in the five or so minutes before this fateful call, the Timbers had started to, started to loosen things up. They'd started to apply some pressure, and it looked like they were starting to get a toehold in the game to the point where I was kind of sitting there thinking, okay, maybe maybe they are going to be able to, you know, get something out of this and 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 put in a performance here in the second half that might be able to get them a point or some points uh, if things go great, but, uh, but just genuinely start playing better. And the call, I mean, the call kind of just ends all of that, right? <laughs> I mean, it just makes it so that the game basically ends. You take the points, great, but the takes stop at 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 that moment because th- yeah, it totally messes up the game. I, I think it was the Portland Pickles on Twitter who said uh, we should play teams with ten players every game, um, which I'm yeah, sure. I mean, uh, I, yeah, I, if you want a big takeaway, it's that if the Timbers are playing a pretty poor opponent at home and they get a free goal and they get a free man advantage, those are good circumstances under which the Timbers can win games. Oh, I, I, that, that's the takeaway. Probably not going to happen again this year or next year or the year after that, or maybe the year after that. Um, but otherwise, I mean, I think you've got to just take the points and, and move on to the next. For sure. No, it, it, the result is the result. You know, you, you end the, the statistic that everybody has been pointing to for weeks saying that, you know, things are falling apart and this, that, and the other. And, you know, the timing of this game was good playing one of the worst teams in the league in a place that they've never won. Uh, and getting... hey, they won in 1982. I was negative three years old. <laughs> yeah, well, never won an MLS era for sure. All right, uh, but enough. but not since the Reagan administration have they uh, have they won first term Reagan administration. For, first too. term Reagan <laughs> uh, have have they won at Providence Park? That's a long freaking time ago. Um, that first half was obviously brutal, and I I think you know they they were trying different things. They went with the three in the back, um, the Mabiala thing. I mean, he hasn't really played at all this year. Uh, he's at pretty much the tail end of his career. His mistake led to the second goal, um, and he came off at halftime. Um, it, it was rough overall, though, not obviously just on Larry. It's just the attention to detail, the, um, they the response. The they, were, they were dead in the no they, they, they There was no real creativity. And, and you know, you, you hear the announcers on Apple TV talking about the you know talent in the on the attacking side for the timbers but they weren't they weren't displaying it you know they they didn't put themselves in positions to make those plays and showcase what i think is a talented front line of players um jonah rodriguez was benched for the first half apparently according to phil neville he was pretty pissed about that uh and he came out in the second half with some fire and credit to him you know we haven't seen that on a consistent basis from jonathan rodriguez yet this season um but maybe he just needed a little fire under the rear end. One note about uh, halftime that that I think that a lot of people are <laughs> are talking about uh, this morning was the the hot mic situation um, for for our friend Adam Sussman who uh, hosts the pod 
who hosts a podcast about the Timbers uh, now where he, he does some in-depth interviews and also the halftime show for, for the radio broadcasts uh, locally. Um, just want to say out front that Adam is like a great guy, like have, getting to know him on the beat the last couple of years, genuinely cares about the club, you know, has, has been uh, nothing but professional in, in every setting that he's been in really curious, intelligent guy. Um, definitely made a mistake there on, on the hot mic. Uh, but, but I mean, whether I, it's I, even his mistake or not is, is, uh, another question. I, I mean, my, my yeah. take on that is that hot mics happen and people have opinions, get over it. People like, have opinions and, and, <laughs> like, you know, it's fine. obviously, it's obviously it's a bad look when, you know, you're, you're somebody employed by the team, but I will say this, every fan in that building was thinking or saying something as bad or worse. All about it reveals the... is that he has eyes. Yeah. <laughs> like, all I it... mean, come on. <laughs> all... He was watching the same thing that we were, <laughs> that we were watching. So yeah. Um... Hot mics happen. People, people have opinions, get over it and move on. Yeah. Um, my, my take I mean, is that there like, should like... be no consequences there. He, Adam is, Adam is a pro. Dude, yeah. So that's for... a, that's a hard take. I mean, like hard take that. Yeah. Hot mics happen. People have opinions, move on. Uh, by far the funnier thing in MLS last night was the raccoon. In oh the, yeah, I mean that was that was quality, <laughs> quality stuff. Yeah, and the, oh. the play-by-play guy continuing to to run through the the various moments, uh, including that escape near the end where the raccoon had like four people around it and just bolted down the sideline. I saw a heat map for the raccoon on Twitter, which is oh, hilarious. Nice. Yeah, that's so, that's good stuff. I that, mean, I, I thought it was a little bit of an unfortunate ending for the raccoon. If anything, I thought the center referee in the Timbers game deserved to be the one carried off the field, kind of gently smushed between two trash cans uh, instead of the raccoon. I thought the raccoon performed fairly well well and that was a little bit of an ignominious exit for uh what was otherwise an honorable performance but hey what are you what are you gonna do uh trash panda you know had a good run so going forward for the timbers obviously then this is a result that they had badly needed but they don't get a whole lot of a break here they they play minnesota united this weekend a, a team that that has been playing very well as of late um not exactly the the sort of opportunity you want to continue the momentum from from this game, you you might want maybe another home game like a I mean, little, you little can't further play out. Bottom but... table teams at home every time they got no. two in a row. They won one of them. What do you want? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Eventually, you got to play like you know real teams. Yeah, so this is this is them playing a real team, and can They're they playing a real team this weekend? Can they continue this? I don't know. I I I'm not terribly confident. I think that this is a a team that has still yet to figure out its identity and play with any sense of sort of cohesion. People were talking last night about the Timbers being a team that looks like they don't even practice with each other. And, and at times, honestly, like some some of the miscommunications and the passes and, and everything. Lack it was, of movement in the attack, the the lack of organization and defense and, and in possession. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's not a ridiculous take. What what do you think then are, are some of the big things that um, – that you saw out of last night that were positives that, that can maybe be harnessed. The to, vibes. I mean, vibes? in, 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 in okay. some respects, in some respects, this is going to kind of put to the test, whether the, the Timbers problems are vibes oriented or X's and O's oriented. Phil Neville is ta- has staked out a pretty hard position over the course of the last several weeks that, that they're vibes related uh, and, and that it's lack of confidence and, and those sorts of things. Uh, I disagree I think the, the the challenges have been more organizational and X's and O's and uh, and that, you know, the vibes come from good organization and good preparation. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think you can expect that the vibe is going to be a little bit better around the team after after that result. Uh, caught a little bit of a break and, and, and got a win, got off the schneid. And and, you know, if Neville's right that this is that that the the malaise has been vibes then maybe we will see a significantly better performance on the weekend oh i'm skeptical of that i remain skeptical of that today uh but look i mean only one way to find out and that's to put it to the test uh and so if the timbers come out this weekend and and look significantly better than they have uh and go and get a result at minnesota uh then I think maybe you can you can say there was something to Neville's Neville's sort of position that this is a a, a lack of you know confidence and and buy in and and those sorts of things. Oh, if on the other hand they they turn around and they kind of look more like the team they were in the first half against San Jose or they were against Seattle, uh, then I think it's going to make his position increasingly untenable. 
one position though that is that is i mean it was never particularly tenable it was always kind of hogwash uh and is just like especially hogwash now are are neville's complaints about referees like after that one last night like shut your mouth about the not about getting the short end of the stick with the referees like you, you can't say that basically for the rest of the season well uh, yeah and one. and when when you're in mls you're gonna more often than i think should happen you're gonna get the short end of the stick with referees in in key situations just because like the performance and the quality of officiating in the league has just been awful this year and it's really up and down i mean and look i mean there are a lot of things to talk about with this one thing that is that has been under discussed is the fact that the referee pool in mls has had to grow significantly over the course of the last few years because of because of expansion there are just a lot more games there are a lot more teams than there used to be and I think that has just made the pool less consistent. Oh, and so, yeah, you're getting stuff. But honestly, I mean, you look back over the course of the the, the calls that the Timbers have had this year, sort of setting last night aside. Yeah, there have been some that are debatable, but I think the Timbers have gotten as good as they've get, they've given uh, in, in, in terms of those. And so I don't think that's been a genuine talking point. I think that's been a distraction. Oh. Last night, it was a genuine talking point, and it was one that cut very, very hard against, uh, you know, sort of in favor of the Timbers. Uh, and so I I hope that puts, you know, puts to bed this discussion of, of the Timbers not getting breaks from referees, because goodness gracious, they got a massive one last night. What is the deal with with the attack right now tactically what why why is it that with these individual players being as talented as they are with evander being the sort of engine room guy in in central midfield that you want to be making your plays with felipe mora frankly being in in really good form for stretches of this season you know what what's the deal here like why the defense obviously has been something that everybody is focused on they've given up multiple goals in so many games this year it's it's clearly it's the bigger issue but you know when you're in those situations you you're going to need to score goals to make up for it and get points and they did last night um with some help but what 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 is the issue there to you what what are you seeing i mean the biggest thing that i think is really really apparent is just the lack of movement off the ball. And there are so many instances, both against Seattle and in this in the first half against San Jose, in which the Timbers would get the ball into the the, the final third, and there just wouldn't be options because there just wouldn't be any movement. I mean, you you watch a team like the Columbus Crew, for example, and it is really dynamic and it's really hard to defend. When there's not movement, it's not hard to defend. And uh, and you get lots of moments where you get somebody like Santi Moreno or Evander who get the ball at their feet, usually in a spot on the wing, and they kind of look up and they're like, okay, don't have a lot to do. Um, and they hoof across a lot of times and it gets cleared out and and that's the end of it. Yeah, Mosquera was in those situations a, a lot, lot last night. Yeah. And 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 so, you know, I think that's been and that's been a big factor. Uh I think there's a pretty good argument to be made that a lot of it comes out of the lack of a sort of just general lack of identity in terms of how they're going to create chances and how they're going to create scoring opportunities. Because, you know, even with good movement, it's hard to break down a defense that's well established, right? And this isn't a Timbers team that's done a consistent job of of getting out on the counter. Uh, it's not a Timbers team that seems to be playing in a way that's designed to create those opportunities. And, and you know, I mean, they just re- haven't really had much of an identity in terms of how they're going to get the defense moving and create that space, right? They they don't seem to have really clear ideas in terms of how they're going to do it with the ball, all of, like the crew. Uh, they they don't seem to have, have, you know, be sort of selling out uh, on winning second balls, all I'll say the 2021 Timbers. Uh, that were just ruthless in in uh in in they would sort of I mean their the, their sort of carbon copy goal would be to play something long, especially toward Dirona Spria, have a contested header, and then just hunt the second ball and look to win it. It's they're not a team uh, that you can tell is is trying to play against the ball uh, and is looking to uh, to win the ball back in promising positions. I'll say you know the New York Red Bulls 
uh, and maybe in the Jesse Marsh era, that is how they feasted. Uh, was they looked to turn uh, other teams over in vulnerable positions. The Timbers don't have anything like and so they don't I think they've not had much of a clear identity and when you don't have much of an identity then you're basically just going to be relying on finding ways in these moments to score goals and frankly there's a good argument that the Timbers did that better than the numbers would have expected that they would have done coming into this game they were overperforming their expected goals they hadn't been generating volumes of chances they would just been finishing at a really 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 high rate of efficiency and so to some extent, I think there was a pretty good case to be made that the that the downturn that we'd seen in the attack over the course of the last couple of weeks was regression to the mean as much as anything. And, and you know, <laughs> and that's what it looked like until until the call. Uh, and that, that totally turned the game last night on its head. And, you know, credit to the Timbers for, for, you know, taking full advantage of that. They almost lost it right at the end. That would have been, that would have been just beyond the pale uh if they had conceded at the death uh, yeah phil i think points. said that that was like the most mad he's ever ever been when they they nearly conceded there at the end and san jose actually wanted a handball in that situation it was i think as close in in that one if yeah, not I, a I, little less a little less uh than than the the goal that or the uh the red card on the i mean the arm end, was but... definitely in a more unnatural position i'm just not sure it actually touched his hand yeah um which is of course an important element of a handball uh, but you know Correct. i mean it, 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 it would have been a bad call if he'd made it just like it was a bad call when he made it on the other end yeah uh so you know i mean in terms of the attack i i think i i, I really do think it is the in the moments in which they've been poor it's 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 tactical it's organization it's preparation it's all of those things that I think have been troubling this team over the course of the last several several weeks. And I'm not sure we got a lot of answers to those things last night. But, you know, Phil Neville's theory of the case has always been that this is about confidence, that it's about the vibes. And if that's if he's right, then I would expect to see a much, much better performance on the weekend. For sure. Even on short rest. Gotta, Even on gotta, short rest. Got to see more. If, if, the sure. vibes are, if the vibes are good now, you know, then time to put up or shut up. And got to see more for a full 92 just to yeah. just to put a closer on this. It it can't be, oh, well, we turned it around in the second half and got a point. It's like, no, you got to like first whistle to final whistle. You got to got to have something cooking here yeah. that's, that's at least remotely competitive. Um, speaking of competitive, speaking of very competitive, very competitive, the Portland Thorns getting uh, more competitive every week. Five wins in a row under Rob Gale, who has become the becoming something of a cult hero in, in Portland right now. Uh ran up into the into I the strongly stands. disagree with the Kennergy stuff. That is not the reference. The dude is straight up Robert. He Dubois. made he made that reference though is why is why people are saying the Kennergy thing because <laughs> he was talking about his daughter helping him pick out a, a suit uh and and mentioning Kennergy. So so that's his own creation. But I Robert Duvall, that's a that's a pretty yeah, good I mean, reference. He's, yeah. he's a dead ringer for Robert Duvall. You're like yeah. a young Robert Duvall. Absolutely. I mean, like middle-aged Robert Duvall. Let's, let's, <laughs> let's not flatter Rob too much. So, so Duvall's aside, the the Portland Thorns four zero over over Seattle Rain. Uh, I was at that game. It was so much fun to be back at Providence Park uh, and to experience a, a pretty full house uh, for a rivalry match that you know the the Thorns showcased some some serious serious progress in a lot of areas. Rob Gale th- might be a wartime conciliary. He he may well be the the guy that they hire at the end of this, right? There's we'll there's we'll, we'll see we'll, we'll but, see what but happens. He might be a wartime but... conciliary, which is just a an, a, I'm I'm in flattering myself with Robert Duvall references. Yeah, this is a this is a very <laughs> Duvall heavy <laughs> beginning to to this discussion, but but one I think that is relevant. Um, four four different goal scorers, uh, three assists, and a goal for Sophia Smith, who just continues to add to the, that goal contribution number. Uh, and make a, a very strong case for another NWSL MVP. Um, I mean, she's leading in goals and assists right now. So yeah. if the award was given today, there's not a discussion to be had. No, there isn't. And and she's been so, so good. Uh, and, and that playmaking for her, I think, is at a peak in her career right now with those three assists being good examples. Um, you know, Peyton Linehan getting in on the action again, the rookie who who I think has has been a really welcome sight. Hina Sugita, who, you know, really only got consistently back in the lineup under Gale, uh, had a phenomenal performance again uh for the Thorns. 
just just an overall really strong game against their rivals against a team that you know for stretches fought pretty dang hard in that game and was pretty competitive and then the doors sort of blew open not in the way that they did for for the timbers where where somebody held it open for them a little bit but <laughs> no no they blew the doors open they in, kicked in the door instance. down yeah, themselves yeah. and so that that credit to the thorns for doing that and you know having the the wherewithal to to blow a game open like that that can be so competitive between these te- these two teams we know that you know year in and year out the rain and the thorns are gonna have these like physical nasty tough fun games and that's what it was each other. It, it, it was, it, was yeah. it was pretty physical and it was pretty tight for a long time it was and and it was you know nervy a little bit in moments that maybe the the rain were going to equalize but you know credit to the thorns obviously great performance five wins in a row is nothing to shake a stick at uh that is just really strong strong stretch for this team yeah you know one great combo save from shelby hogan and, and kelly hubley um in a moment in, in a moment in which the one of the few moments in the game in which the rain were applying some pressure i actually thought the way the thorns managed the game as a whole other than maybe those few moments uh in the first half was fantastic i i mean they they weren't super dangerous in the attack for a lot of it uh, but I mean, you're not going to, I mean, this is, this is just the lesson that should have been taken quite a while ago, uh, about thorn teams, which is you can't go out and approach every game. Like you're trying to win at four zero, right? Because if you, if you try to win four zero every game, you're going to have a lot of two twos and three threes. Um, whereas a lot of times if you approach, especially the beginning of a game, like we're expecting this to be tight, we're going to make it tight. Um, we're going to make their build out difficult, which I thought the Thorns just did an amazing job of. Thorns have pressed fairly high a lot of the year. Um, and a lot of the time they've, I think they lead the league still in, uh, in attacking half, uh, defensive actions and balls won, uh, in, in the attacking half, but that wasn't what they were trying to do, uh, in, in this game. What they were trying to do was unbalance the, 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 the rain attack and really just make their build out much, much more difficult. And I thought, by and large, they did a really nice job of that. The Reigns attack and 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 their possession structure was just a bit of a mess all night. Uh, and I thought that was because the Thorns just did a great job of not letting them get to the spots that they wanted to get to, forcing them to play uncomfortable uh, balls sort of in their in their mid build up. And 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 as a result, by and large, this was a Rain team that they've struggled to score goals coming in. Uh, but very much continued uh, that pattern and didn't have a ton uh, in terms of opportunities. And as we've discussed, if you just do competent, smart things around Sophia Smith, Sophia Smith is going to find you goals, right? Like whether it's her scoring or somebody else scoring, and and she she uh, did some of the assisting this this time around. Uh, she's going to find you goals, and just having the faith that that's going to happen is a pretty good game plan. And so getting that first one, I thought was was great, and also to be expected that that's going to happen most of the time. Uh, that that they're going to find one. It was a really good goal, uh, a really nice finish from Olivia Moultrie. Good flick on header from Christine Sinclair, and then and then so providing the assist. Uh, I mean, good goal from sort of a, a direct, I think, goal kick situation, um, and you know, all around. Great. That's the kind of class that they have to be able to score those goals. But the thing that that I just thought was fantastic about the way they managed the game is they just chose exactly the right moment as the rain were starting to take more risks. They were starting to push the fullbacks higher. The Thorns said, okay, we haven't been playing with wingers so far in this game. Basically been playing pretty narrow. Um, now we're bringing on wingers at the same time. Two of them. And it from there it was just haymakers, haymakers, and yeah, that's Janine how you in, win. Janine in particular, when you, as soon as she came on, yeah, uh, it, it's funny. Uh, it it lines up sort of with uh, people had posted this video of of Sink coming off and and high fiving Janine. Uh, I won't obviously use the words that Sink used, um, but but she said fudge them up. You can imply maybe, and they it. did. And, and then it and was just haymakers. Yeah, it was total haymakers. And and it that ability to adjust, that ability for, for the Thorns to adjust to the game state, to change their tactics accordingly, 
And, and that's how you win games. That's yeah, that, how you win games against yeah. good teams. That's how you win. That's how you, you succeed in a, a, a league that, that is deep. It is. It, it's, it's unquestionably, you know, a, a sign of genuine progress for the thorns. This, this winning streak is no fluke. This is a no. team that is, is genuinely inspired by their coach. Somebody who as a side note and, and shouldn't be a side note. It should be a, a, a note at the, the front of the, the pack here. Um, Rob Gale has overcome a cancer diagnosis in the last year. He talked about it in the post game press conference on Saturday for the first time publicly. Um, this is something that folks in the organization have talked about behind the scenes as, as something that's been really inspirational. Um, and, and he held up the photo of, of basically a year ago prior to, to Saturday's game. Um, you know, he, he was getting help from, from people on staff, their, their spouses, you know, wheelchaired out of the hospital, um, and, and was back at it, uh, coaching pretty soon after. And now in addition to, you know, inspiring these players through his own personal journey, he's inspired them on the pitch in ways that, you know, you look at those first few games where they were winless. Um, th there didn't seem to be a lot of inspiration. There didn't seem to be a lot of this, you know, energy and, and belief and, there, there seems to, to be a little bit of shakiness and, you know, walking on a tightrope sort of feeling for this team that carried over from last season. Uh, and now they look like the Portland Thorns. Now they look like a team that, regardless of their positioning in the NWSL table, uh, feels like one that would be terrifying for opposing teams to match up with on, on a week-to-week -week basis. Even with, obviously, a, a major loss in the injury of Morgan Weaver, um, the the quality and I think the depth that they're they're starting to showcase with the young players coming on as they are uh, and the development that they are showing uh, within the confines of of this streak um, should have Thorns fans really excited. This is this is a, a team to look out for and the ability to to sort of feel the tempo of games to know when during games to be organized and compact and to be happy to make it difficult for the opponent, and then also to know when the circumstances are ripe to be ruthless. I mean, that's, that's, that's how you win games against good teams. And, and I, the rain have, have really struggled. Uh, and so, you know, they are definitely not the, 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 the class of team that the Thorns need to be able to do that against if they want to win trophies. Uh, but in, that is not a that that's not something the thorns could have done six weeks ago i mean that game might go two two or something like that or maybe it's a three two well you know one way or the other but that's not something that they were doing and so you know i i think i i, I think it's been a very very good stretch both from the team uh and from from gail i think uh gail has done one thing that serves two groups extremely extremely well He's given time. He's given the Thorns time to make their coaching decision. And that serves him well because that gives him time to make his case for being the not just interim head coach. But it also just it also gives the Bethals time to to both assess the field of available coaches and to assess Gale. If they had continued struggling, there would have been a lot of pressure uh, on the Bethals to make a quick decision. Uh, and uh, and to make a quick move, and the this recent spell from the thorns has sort of taken the pressure off of everybody, and given the time that Gale needs to make his case as to why he should be the next full head coach uh, of this club, but also the Bethals the time to step back to look at the field to look at Gale and and make the right decision for the club. So. All of that is, is, is very, very good. It's full credit to everybody who's involved. I mean, this is, this is what you hope for. But it also can't just be five games. Uh, they've, been, they've showed pretty consistent progress over the course of these last four or five weeks. And that needs to continue. I don't think they're at their ceiling yet. I, I, I think there are, still, uh, there are still moments in which they could be a bit sharper. Uh, and if they keep if they keep sort of on the path of making this consistent progress, they could get quite scary. Um, I'm not sure they're at the point of being a trophy contender, but I think the trajectory, if they continue on it, is very much going to put them in that category. 
And if they continue on that trajectory, do you think he gets the job? Do you th- I mean, there's a lot of great candidates out there. Don't get me wrong. That's yeah. not dis- discounting there. But, 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 you know, vibes alone, I mean, fans are already calling for him to get hired. They don't really have a say, but that's a different conversation. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, he's, he ran up in the capo stand, man. He he was, you know, throwing his arms up. He, they're five and oh and oh. Yeah. Like it's, it, do you think if this trajectory continues the way it's going or, or close to it, obviously this is a hard thing to, to sustain. I mean, does he, does he get this job too early to call? I think is, is just the short answer. It, it's going to need to be a bigger body of work um, for him to, to demonstrate that because I, frankly, I given everything else going on around the club right now and the club's sort of, you know, <laughs> rising from the ashes over the course of the last few months, Oh, um, I, I think there are going to be a lot of people interested in, in this job and potentially some very good people uh, interested in this job. And so I, I think Gail's going to have some challenging competition. Uh, but, you know, I mean, it depends on how it goes. If, if they win a shield, if they win a championship, yeah, he's getting the job. It's simple. Uh, if they if they fall just short of that, but they nonetheless perform well, then I, I, I think he's a credible candidate. If they sort of plateau or peter out, then probably not. Um, and so I, I, I think the, the determining, the determinants on that are, are, are yet to be seen. And and that's a much, much longer runway, but he's made it a long runway. Yeah. He set himself up very well and, and built yeah. a strong foundation, not only for the team, but for his candidacy to, to yeah, continue. He's to given himself the team. opportunity to prove it. Yeah. And in credit to his entire staff too. Um, Vitas obviously has, has been, um, has been somebody that's been a mainstay and a Timbers legend in his own right. Um, and, and the rest of the staff and the new assistants that have, have come in, um, you know, this is not by any means at, and, and Gail will be the first person to say this. This is not just the Rob Gale show. You know, this is this is something that, you know, I think deserves credit top to bottom on, on the part of the Thorns staff and their preparation for this group. Yeah, no, no doubt. And and the players also deserve a ton of credit. Yes. Uh, for, you know, for rallying not just around him, but around each other uh, to to set, set the course right. I mean, this obviously wouldn't be happening without them. Uh, and, and, you know, the changes that have been made over the course of the last several weeks have, have mattered and have made a difference, but there's, it's clear that there's a lot of buy-in and that there's a ton of hard work going into it. Uh, and, and so, you know, I mean, they all deserve immense credit for, you know, very quickly riding the ship after what was a really, really terrible start to the season. Uh, now they're getting back into the thick of it and the, and that's, that's to all the credit. Yeah. And they have an opportunity on Friday, they're on the road in Houston. They have an opportunity to make it six wins in a row with that one for sure. That's a Houston team that has, has str- struggled as of late. Um, obviously, any game on the road in NWSL is going to be challenging. We'll see what the weather's like down there too. It can get nasty in the in the summertime yeah. in Houston. Um, but that's a, that's going to be an important one for them to get to six. Then I think the big one that you have circled is Orlando because that's an undefeated Pride team that is looking. At dangerous really this this season really dangerous and so that is the biggest test yet i think for for rob gale and company is is can you maintain what you've been doing and get a result on the road that you're proud of and put together a complete performance because then i think the conversation shifts a little bit to like oh okay like you know you, you talked about are they contenders are they potential shield winners champions that sort of thing that conversation, I think, rises for sure. If they sure. get a result in that game, I mean, then there's no question you're talking about them in that class. But Definitely. I mean, right now, right now, just looking at the table, it's it's KC and Orlando and and the rest, right? Oh, um, the that's the next jump that the Thorns need to be able to make, and and if they can go in and get results on the road in in these next couple, if they can go win at Houston and then and then you know get stuck in against uh, against Orlando, then. Yeah, I mean, then you're talking about them making that jump. Uh, even if they don't quite get that sort of, you know, golden path of, of results in these next couple complicated games, um, if they're competitive and, and they're close to it, I think you're saying that this is a team that, that looks like they're on the, on the trajectory toward maybe being able to get there. Uh, I think that's probably more realistic uh, in terms of expectations. Uh, but, you know, who knows? I mean, this is a team that looks a lot better 
than it did a few weeks ago. And we're going to be able to, to really put that to the test now over the course of the next couple of weeks on the road. Absolutely. And, and the build out, uh, you know, on the attack has been really strong. That, that is something that given the level of talent that they have in central midfield and on the attack, that, that that's something you expect from this team and their ability to do so, as you pointed out, in, in a sort of narrow way, but also to get wide and to, to utilize players like Janine Becky and, and even like Sophia Smith, who, who's been out wide in, in certain positions. Um, I, I think that that versatility has been great. The, the thing that has lacked for, for the Thorns over the last year plus that has been ultimately their downfall in a lot of these games has been how they've been playing at the back, how they've defended. And I think that including that obviously save of the week moment for Kelly Hubley, which like what well, an Kelly amazing, that. I mean, amazing Kelly had a really good performance play. against, yeah. against the rain overall. It's been a rough start to the season uh, for Hubley. And so like great to see her not only have, have a great moment, but have a, a, a good full performance uh, in which she, 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 you know, sort of restated a claim uh, to that spot next to Becky Sauerbrunn, which I think is, is, up in the air uh, between she and obeys i think uh is is you know an open competition still oh um, sure but the back line has really i think improved in spades yeah. like it's it's been really really impressive but i i think a lot of it has has to you know i mean a lot of it boils down to what the thorns are doing with their structure how is their shape how is the rest defense what are the positions they're putting their defenders in? We yeah, saw the pressure a little bit of regression. Putting, yeah, the yeah. pressure that they're putting on on the teams in the back has has been significant. I think we arguably saw a little bit of regression or a little bit of a down performance in that respect against Bay, even though they they nonetheless found a, a way to 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 get, take the three points from that game. Um, but it's just the difference of this is not a back line that's going to do well in space. We found that out last year. Um. We found it out again this year uh, that if you're putting the this back line into lots of positions in which they're having to defend in space, they just don't really have the horses to be able to do that, right? And so, I mean, because because of just who's back there, that's not Becky Sauerbrunn's strength at, at this point in her career. That's not Kelly Hubley's strength. Uh, that, that's a difficult spot to put a young defender in like, like Obey's. And, and so that's 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 a problem. They've taken much greater care over the course of the last few weeks not to put themselves in those positions. That's great. Um, and, and, and being a little bit more pragmatic in how they're possessing the ball so that they're not stretching themselves and turning the ball over in, in, uh, in, in, in vulnerable places. I mean, that, that's all the stuff that they need to do and is helping to lead to these better results for the back line because you can get good performances from Becky Sauerbrunn, obviously. You can get good performances, as we saw from Kelly Hubley, and even from uh, Isabella Obes, uh, if you put them in, in positions to be successful. And that's what they've done a better job of over the course of the last few weeks. I really like the canned wine that they have at Providence Park. I've, I've never the canned really... Wine man? I, I, I didn't think I was. I, you know, <laughs> I, I, there, there is a, a certain level of snobbery for me. There's Jerry! Hey, Jerry. Making an appearance. He's getting muted. <laughs> Jerry is getting muted. Um, I would have thought it was one of my three dogs that would have barked uh, <laughs> during the course of this podcast. But Jer Jerry coming up clutch here. Jerry is in like full hunting season. <laughs> like all the all the little animals are out. And so he is just like he is he is on edge. It's been slightly insufferable. Yeah. Our our, uh, our boy Finn, Australian Shepherd, he uh, he he he's checking the squirrels out. So I've, I've had to keep an eye on him throughout this podcast to make sure I'm muted when, uh, when he's near the, the back door. So we have right now, cause we sort of live near a, a like wetland area and there are a bunch of like ducks just like around in the neighborhood. Cause it's just like the season for them to be around and doing, you know, you know, spring things. Yeah. So it's a family show. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and baby little ducklings. Huh? Yeah. Making, making ducklings. Um, and he's just like he's gotten into the habit of basically on walks. He every time he sees a duck, he's just like, I'm just gonna bully this duck. I'm not. I know I'm not gonna get it. It can fly, like, <laughs> but I'm just gonna bully the duck. And we've had conversations about it, but uh, you know, it, it doesn't seem to be taking all that well. Yeah, it's important to talk to your dog about yeah. <laughs> about such behavior. That's right. Um, but yeah, like the the canned wine was good. It, I I liked it. You know, I'm a I'm a wine guy. I've got this right. this tattoo, the wine the wine bottle <laughs> opener. 
uh, for, for those of us uh, on YouTube. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed it. It's a red blend from, from house wine. Uh, this is not sponsored content. I just liked it. So <laughs> I had, I had a good time. I had a couple of them, um, sat in a, a nice, uh, area on the West side of, of Providence park. I mean, um, guy. you're an East side guy. That's right. Yeah, yeah. We were there at the same time. It's too far away for either of us to, to go right. over yeah, like, to, like, to like each other's side all of halftime. If you like try to like meet, and, you know, it takes, it takes a while. It, yeah. Uh, you know, one thing from from my regular field experience uh, a few weeks ago that I I was reminded of and really enjoy, and think we could have a little bit of at, at, at Providence Park. If you sit in the bleachers, especially on a nice day at regular field, you're either in left field or right field. It's G. I kind of like the Timbers Army. Yeah. Oh, um, but if you're sitting in we're we're in right field, and you always get like at some point in the game a, a good like you know left field stinks chant. Don't say they don't say stinks. They say something slightly less family oriented. Oh. Um, and you know, I, I I would get into a a, a West Side Stinks uh, chant from the East Side. I, I I could get into that. I would enjoy that. You're you're an East Side man through and through. It's, it's it's where you sit. Um, but but the features and I think the experience for those on the on the East Side is tangibly different than than what it you is. get on on the West because because the vibes. West the West sort of blends with the North End and too in terms of um of in-game experience and and you know the concessions and everything available but east side is a different deal some west siders would call the east side sort of the corporate side of providence park hmm. what would you take what would you your take be on that that potential insult uh, i i think it's the side that's got the best field views and the readiest access to bathrooms thank you very much that is true you're also exposed to the sun more often, which, you know, that's good from a vitamin D standpoint. But it's true. Can... It usually isn't a huge because I'm on the I'm on the Toyota Terrace. I don't know what the names are to be honest. The sure. second level of the new the the expansion. Oh, um, and it's usually like a, only a sliver of sun. It's like 15 or 20 minutes away if you get any at all. Uh, so that's usually not too bad. Oh, uh, but, you know, yeah, I mean, you, you can you get a little uh, a, a little bit of, uh, of exposure there. It's nice. Just yeah, wear sunscreen. A little SPF can take care of that. Exactly. So that has been your your recap of the the stadium experience at Providence Park. Look West forward. Side stinks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I might be a West Side guy. I'm gonna have to go to more games. Uh, yeah, and sit in different areas to to get a full accounting of of where the best spots are in the stadium. But um, you know, we'll we'll be back plenty of times this year as as the seasons progress for both teams um and that'll wrap it up for us this week on soccer made in portland thanks to chris as always uh and, and thanks to all of you for listening so f- feel free to follow us on twitter at soccer made in pdx chris reifer ryan t clark like subscribe do all the good stuff uh follow oregonian sports podcasts on uh all of your podcasting networks bunch of different pods including a, a really good episode of the oregonian sports podcast uh with with bill orham and tyson Alger uh that just came out a, a couple of days ago prior to to last night's tempers game um so it's so a good talk there on on some some soccer and also everything congratulations else. to bill by the way on uh till mccreamery becoming the the timbers <laughs> uh kid sponsor big big moment for for bill yeah, that's huge. Uh, I would not be surprised uh, if if Bill doesn't get himself one of those those jerseys. At some point, I wouldn't point. be surprised if if Bill just gets the Tillamook tattoo tattooed on his chest, like it's like it's basically his personal kit sponsor. Yeah, that that would be a painful tattoo. It would be a really painful right tattoo. right in the that sternum. Be, yeah, yeah, Ooh, that ouch. that's a that's a rough one. But but Bill's tough. He he could Timbers take it. Timbers win MLS Cup this year. Bill's got to get that tattoo. Okay, yeah. Uh, this is like where he promised to eat his shirt if the WNBA team doesn't come That's here. That's right. That's I, right. I, I he think can he eat his shirt to, to reveal up. the 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 Tillamook kit sponsor tattoo on his chest. Yes. Yeah, so if Timbers win MLS Cup this year, uh, I think Bill should promise that. I'll promise that yeah. on his behalf. Who cares? Yeah. I mean, we'll, uh, we'll volunteer. <laughs> yeah. Why not? <laughs> so uh, that that will wrap it for us there. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, Bill. Uh, doesn't end up in the tattoo shop, but but you know if you're a Timbers fan, you're hoping he does. So uh, thanks thanks everybody for joining us this week, and we'll, we'll catch you again soon.